Okay, first of all, I have to say, again, uh, you know, I, I, I do these Q&As, I moderate Q&As, I'm, I'm a producer for Access Hollywood, and I'm a reviewer for Access Hollywood, and this is one mighty intense movie, and I'd like to ask, starting with you, David, tell me why this was your follow-up to Animal Kingdom. Um, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent quite a lot of time after Animal Kingdom came out, and it felt like my life had turned upside down, um, trying to work out what to do next. You know, and I, 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 I felt like I had a lot of stuff to wade through. A lot of, not just projects, but um, possibilities, uh, different ways of working. Um, blah, blah, blah. I, anyway, I, I came back to, I, I, I found myself after like a, a lot of, you know, a lot of doing a, a million meetings and, and reading a, a lot of screenplays that I knew I wasn't going to like. Um, coming back to the idea, I'm really, really being attracted to the idea of, of making the rover because I knew I wanted to, I, 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 it would allow me the opportunity to play in a similar sort of tonal world to the world of Animal Kingdom, a, you know, a kind of brooding menace, but um, it also, it offered me the opportunity to, to do something that was very different on a formal level, you know, whereas Animal Kingdom is a big sort of, a, a sort of, a dense um, urban fabric, uh, you know, and almost a kind of slightly heightened social realist kind of crime drama. And I just loved how simple and elemental, and uh, you know, almost like a kind of dark, violent fable this movie was, and that it would, and that it was, you know, instead of that dense fabric, it was just it was just a couple of characters um, having a really intensely intimate relationship in a vast, empty, hostile landscape. Well, tell me why, I, I think I read uh, one of the articles out of can how this story sort of came out of a feeling of frustration, a feeling of anger that you had at the time and you channeled that into the story. I mean, yeah, when I was, as I was drafting it later, you know, and I started redrafting it, this wasn't long after the, the economic crisis. I, I mean, I did just find after a certain point in my life that I was carrying around this weird feeling of despair and or anger, you know, I, I, maybe it's just me and I'm getting older or whatever, but you know, this was, this was not long after the economic crisis, it would seem that we had just willingly surrendered the world to psychopaths in suits, um, while simultaneously, while simultaneously just throwing the towel in on, you know, what is arguably the greatest moral challenge of our time, which is addressing climate change. And I just found myself waking up in the morning going, yeah, what's the point? You know, I mean, and like, I mean, I, that's a bit clear. It was an actual kind of despair that for the first time since I was a little kid, in a way, I actually found myself not thinking about the future as a good place, you know? And I started funneling that despair and that anger into the world of the movie, you know, this whatever this kind of near future is, and funneling the anger especially in the guy's character. Well, guy Pierce, who you work with on Animal Kingdom, I mean, he was terrific, exceptionally terrific as Eric. And just tell me, like, what it was like to to work with him again. And uh, I understand that you actually wrote the role for him. Yeah, I mean, I love, I really love working with Guy. He's a really, you know, it's, I mean, just as an actor, he's so, so beautifully, supremely talented, you know, that he... He offers. He's a, he's, a, he's a pleasure to direct because he offers. Uh, he, he offers the director, you know, the, the opportunity to perform the tiniest little microsurgical adjustments on a performance. You know, you never, I never have to feel like I'm painting in broad brush strokes with him. Like we can get right in there, and I never have to feel like I have to pussyfoot around him either. You know, quite often you 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 know when you you you're, you're learning how to direct actors. You know, it gets drilled into you that there are certain things you have to play, kind of very simple, sort of playable, playable actions. It's got to, you know, you've got to talk in transitive verbs and all this kind of stuff. And with Guy, you know, it's like, you don't have to do that. You just talk about life. He gets what you're talking about. Then he goes away and very quickly makes it playable for himself. And, but more than anything, in this movie, I really wanted him... Guy does that. He's so good at doing that really still, powerful 
uh, that, that really kind of powerful and often intimidating stillness that he can also just fill with like very subtle emotional detail. Uh, and this character really needed it. You know, you don't know a lot about this guy, but over the course of the film, it was important to me that you just slowly get clear hints at the the the, the degrees and types of his, his emotional damage. You know, I read a review, Rob, that said, and I quote, regarding the rover, Robert Pattinson is a revelation. Woo! You know who wrote that review? I do. <laughs> well, you know, Rob, I want to ask you how did this project come about for you, and why did you just see see it as just a really great challenge to do something completely different? Um, I'd seen uh, the teaser, tra the teaser trailer for Animal Kingdom years ago, um, and wanted to meet David from that because I just thought it was just what you could pack into one that has it by someone. And uh, just in 60 seconds, you could kind of tell immediately that was someone I want to work with. And, so, and I think Animal Kingdom is like one of the best dating movies in the last 10 years or something. Um, I also think one of the opening shot of Crossbow is probably one of the best shots in the history of cinema. Which I haven't told you <laughs> It's a shot of a bush. I don't think you think it's a good shot. Learning on the crack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the script came along. I met David about a year before I did the script and then read it and thought it was kind of like mind blowing. And um, just incredibly original and, and uh, sort of vicious. I thought it was strangely funny as well. No one else seems to be I think it, I mean, I, I get where you're coming from. Uh, but in terms of like your, the look, your, your character, the shaved head, or the, the buzz cut rather, and the teeth, I mean, is that something that was sort of laid out for the character or did you? What else did you bring other than what was written on the page? I don't even think there was a, there was a character description, right? It's just saying it's from the South. But, but uh, yeah, I don't think there was anything. Um, I don't know, I, I saw these photos of a bunch of guys, kind of, sort of white, trashy looking guys. You know, <laughs> and, and a few. I think that was kind of, it's quite a popular actor. Yeah. <laughs> Still is. So, no, and it's like, yeah, no, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of trendy now. So <laughs> well, what about working with Guy? I mean, he's he's uh, really intense in this movie, and I mean, all your your it's, it's the two of you together, basically the entire time, and all, that's almost it, other than the people that you guys shoot. So, what was it like just spending all that time with him, and what, you know, sort of pick up from him as an actor? Uh, uh, I mean, it's a lovely person. Uh, it's kind of makes it easier. Um, but I don't know, it's, it, his part is really, really difficult. I mean, it's, it's basically like a constant force. I mean, he, there's never any, very, very rarely a time his pressure lets up. I don't quite know how he was doing it, so I don't really know what I've learned. I've just learned that it's possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could really feel it, even when we're just sitting in silence in the car, it's, he's still sort of radiating. Um, he has a sort of vibration. And you kind of feel it, and it, it, it kind of provokes tons of reactions. I sure did love dogs. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to ask you, David, the intensity, I, I had not heard or read one review, reaction from this movie, where the word intense was not mentioned, in a good way, because I mean, that's really just, it's, to maintain that for the duration of the film. So I understand that you're a fan of John Carpenter, and I uh, was wondering if, if the work of John Carpenter has inspired you, not just with Animal Kingdom, but with the rover as well. Not really. I mean, I really like John Carpenter, but no, that has never... And I'm sure I absorb everything that I've ever seen by osmosis somehow, but no, I, I don't... Uh, no. I don't think it ever... There's never been a moment when John Carpenter has entered my thinking on either of these movies. Well, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you too, listen, uh, obviously, as Angelinos, when it gets hot in LA and it's 100 degrees, yeah, people say, oh, it's dry heat, but it's still pretty damn hot. And when you walk outside and get in your car and it says 108 degrees, you go, damn, that's hot. 
but where you guys shot this movie, it got well over 110 degrees. I was like 122. 122 is the number. So what was it like filming for, what, two months in those conditions? It was kind of weirdly okay. I actually think it was about 123 the week before we went to, we did our, before we started shooting, we did our tech recce. It was like 123, but I think it was like 50 degrees Celsius, and it was scary. It was so hot. I mean, we knew we couldn't work in it. It, was, it felt dangerous. I mean, it's amazing what just the drop down, when it drops down to, you know, say 115, 116, it suddenly feels like a cool change. And if you've, got, if you've got water to drink and some shade to stand under, it's okay. It's desert heat, you know. Give me that over humidity. Anyway. And also the, the, the flies, I mean, the flies just I mean, look, look like just were relentless, you know, but, uh, but that really does add to the character. It does add to the vibe. And uh, ultimately, it made for a better film, I think. You know, it's, it's like almost like any kind of movie you make under diversity, you have that uh, diversity and adversity comes a work of art. So, congrats on that. <laughs> um, but I also want to ask you just the, the reactions you've gotten from when the movie premiered in Cannes. And, and it's really just getting a very strong reaction of why do you think people are just really taken so much with the movie and just they just love it so much and especially Rob, I mean the reviews you've got in particular have been just great, so that's gotta be a good feeling for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean annoyingly, you always just tend to seek out the bad ones anyway. The good ones. And your one obviously will stay in my heart. Aww. <laughs> the rest of my life. <laughs> Kind of, but you just you know you, it, it's more about the experience. I mean, uh, the, the experience, and also just when you see something on the page which you love so much right from the beginning. I think most of the time you're just thinking, I just don't want to mess it up. And so right. when you can watch the movie and you feel like you kind of have totally messed it up, then <laughs> that's about what I'm trying to aim for. <laughs> like, and the rest of it's just. Well, I'd like to open questions up to the audience. If you got uh, questions, please raise your hand. And sir, you, in the blue shirt, yeah, nice and loud, please. I was wondering about the music, the really like, eclectic mix of songs. If you'd rather want to know uh, where the inspiration for those were. The inspiration for the score and the music. It was very eclectic. Uh, yeah, weird. Um, <laughs> it was, I, you know, I, when I'm writing especially, I start building playlists. Um, just I, I can't write with music playing, but I just, it's just you know over however many months I'm writing, I'm just constantly thinking about the world of the movie that I'm inventing, and we'll just be building playlists, and those playlists get really long, and sometimes they even involve me diving down, like I go down sort of seven hour iTunes rabbit holes, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, listeners who bought this also liked this, and you, know, you follow that for like seven hours, you get to some pretty interesting places, and, and in the course of that, I discovered some people that I really, really loved, you know, like, uh, like Colin Stetson, who does all of that strange saxophone stuff in there, or William Bozinski, who's this beautiful pianist composer who does these kind of long... Uh, piano loops that sort of fall apart, and then you know compositions by a guy named Giacinto Celsi, just the, which is beautiful string stuff, but principally that just you know feels like metal grating against metal. And what I did find was that you know because it's setting a movie that's a few decades in the future, I didn't want to have to try and make the soundtrack futuristic. I wanted to. I actually really loved the idea of taking very traditional instruments, but ones that were being performed in very unusual ways, and. Uh, um, and yeah, that seemed to do the trick. And then my, and then Anthony Partos, who I worked with on Animal Kingdom, just sort of gave me some of the connecting tissue. Who's got a question? You, young lady. Nice and loud. Sure. Um, you mentioned dogs, and it did feel kind of dog centric to me. At the beginning, when you know, Eric you kind of shows humanity by the men having a dog, and they're wanting a dog, and then with the killing of the gem and the holding the gun, he felt that he abused the dog, and then um, and the dog was the, sitting there with the dogs in the cages. Am I reading too much of this? Would the brain kind of become his lost dog? Interesting, interesting. The question was, did Ray sort of become Eric's 
lost puppy in a way, right? Yeah, we lost a dog too. Right. Okay, that's a wow. We really ran into this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfectly reasonable rating. Uh, good, good call. Here, here's what I said. I interviewed these uh, gentlemen this afternoon. I said, wait a minute. So I get why it's called the Rover, but is it also be called called the Rover because Rover is a common dog name? And they're like, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I thought I was on to something here. <laughs> Who else has a question? Uh, yes, you. Bob. My question is for Rob. I wanted to know how difficult was it for you to have a southern accent, and how did you prepare for that southern accent? How difficult was it for you, Rob, to have a southern accent? What did you do to prepare? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what accent I'm doing. <laughs> 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 I don't prepare for that much either. And also, I was surrounded by a bunch of Australians, so no one could tell anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was kind of on the, it was on the page. It was, it was a fun, the Southern accent is fun. Kind of, especially when you add little quirks to it and stuff. Uh, but yeah, when Scoot turned up, I was terrified because he was just going to be thinking, what is that? <laughs> Who's next? You, Emily. Um, for either or both, both of you, um, what was your favorite scene to shoot and why? What was your favorite scene to shoot and why? Uh, for me, it's, you know, it's kind of, as, this is really boring, but for me, it's like, you know, that the long campfire scene. I mean, that's, that for me is the thrill of, the thrill of making movies. It's just having kind of created two characters and then you get great actors to, Bring them to life, and then you're, and then you have that, that, that long night where we just made it work. You know that that for me is thrilling. That's the you know, just you know massaging performances and and you know watching the thing that has been in gestation for a long time finally come into being. Who is next? You, sir. Nice and loud. Kind of preparation you did for the, some of the long shots that just stayed on the characters for a while. Yeah, I mean, you always allow yourself wiggle room. You always should shoot more than you need. And it was always very important to me that those couple of opening shots be long. A, because I wanted to get a sense of the, um, the, the uh, you know, kind of guy's strange stagnation. You know, the, the, the what's that word? Doesn't matter. Um, um, <laughs> You know that whatever that this is, you know that that, that his atrophy or whatever that this man had, you know, it's, he just he could barely he could barely find reason to move anymore. But I also to pre pre prepare the. I knew I was, I'm about to give the audience a big car chase. I want to prepare them at the outset. I want them to know that that's not going to be. This, this is going to be a car chase movie. But once that car chase is out of the way, it's going to slow right down. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I I have a question about. So you filmed this like way out in the boonies at the Australian Outback. And okay, so you film during the day, it's hot. Okay, night, you lose the light. You shot there for two months. What you guys do at night? <laughs> uh, just looking at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned today that you saw, I mean, the, just looking up in the sky was a big deal. Yeah, there's no ozone. It's a star. Not, I mean, you're so far from the city lights. I totally forgot as well. There's, I didn't get to do this, um, but our armorer um, had night vision goggles. And apparently when you're out there and you put night vision goggles on and you look up at the sky, it's like, you, it's awe inspiring. I mean, it's like literally just the sky is a blanket of stars. Um, that was worth it right there. Who's, who's next? Yes, you. You name it the dog? Or General? <laughs> I can't remember how it... I know the dog happened really early on in the process because I knew that at a certain point I knew quite... 
I became apparent to me that what I was writing was a sort of dark, violent fable, and I, and so in that context, it felt entirely reasonable and appropriate that it have a kind of strangely round, sentimental ending. Um, <coughs> having said that, you know that 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 ending with the dog for me is just like a, it's like a coda or an epilogue. It's not really the conclusion. I never wanted it. I never particularly wanted it to feel like a twist or. A, or, uh, or uh, you know, a hard conclusion. I've, I always wanted it just to be a final little piece of, of, of Guy's emotional jigsaw puzzle, you know, that this is... So you just can go right back to the very first shot of the movie and, and have some sense as to what he might have been sitting in his car contemplating. Um, but for me, the, the movie actually technically ends before the dog. It's, you know, it's him looking at a mess he's made, a mess of bodies. Everywhere he goes, he makes a mess. And everywhere he goes, he thinks it somehow. He probably has for you know, a decade thought that that mess was somebody else's fault. And for the first time ever, he has that moment of realising that this is a, a, a mess entirely of his creation. And for the first time ever, he cleans it up with a certain reverence and ceremony. Time for one more question. Let's make it a good one. You, right in the front row. No pressure. No pressure. Which scene was most challenging to film? Which scene was most challenging to film? From the beginning <laughs> to the end of <ending> credits. <laughs> Car chase is just because it's because it's boring to shoot. I you know it's you know I love fooling around fooling around with actors and all that kind of stuff. And as soon as you're doing a car chase, you're only doing you know maybe on a normal day you, you if you do if you're moving well you get somewhere between you know 12 and 16 shots per day. And as soon as you start shooting a car chase, you're doing four shots a day, and it's and it's just so tedious and mechanical and. As soon as you, your actors are in the car doing anything, act, having to act in any way, I'm not getting to kind of go and whisper to them and stuff. I'm just screaming at them through a walkie-talkie. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's fun when you finally get to put it all together in an edit room, and then even funner when you get into the world of sound. But when you're actually shooting it, it's just up and down the road, up and down the road, for days and days and days. But a movie like The Rover, you know, we're in the summer season, and it's all about superheroes and spaceships. But a movie like The Rover, the way for the words to get out there is by word of mouth. And what is word of mouth in today's day and age? It's social media. So the movie's in select theaters now. It opens nationwide next weekend. So make sure you get on Facebook. You get on Twitter. I don't know if you're still using uh, MySpace uh, <laughs> or Friendster. But uh, please do get the word out. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this Q&A. And thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the meeting. Thank you.